Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us for episode 31 in the Gleeble webinar series. This is Dan Quigley with DSI, and I'm happy you could join us. And on behalf of everyone at DSI, we hope that you and those close to you are staying safe and healthy. We do appreciate you spending time with us. We have a very interesting presentation today focused on assessing creep damage in service exposed power plant steel using the Gleeble and digital image correlation. As always, our goal will be to keep this webinar to one hour or less. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit them using the chat feature here in the webinar. Our team will be available to answer some questions directly via the chat, and if time allows, we'll have a live Q&A uh, with our presenter following the presentation. Uh, video of this presentation will be available online soon, and certificates will be emailed to you if you are listening to this live. Uh, you'll be able to find a link to this video as well as videos of past webinars by going to our website at Gleeble.com and then clicking on the resources link in the top navigation bar. Then click on webinars and there you can view past webinars and sign up for future webinars. We do have some scheduling updates. As we approach the holiday season, we will only have one more webinar this year. Uh, it'll be on December 17th. Uh, then we'll take a break and pick up the webinar series, uh, pick it up back up in early 2021. So there won't be a webinar next week on December 10th, uh, but we will have the session on December 17th, 2020. But I'll be sending out an email invitation to everyone as we get closer to the date. Uh, I've heard that some people, some people aren't getting my emails. They're either uh, getting going into spam or they're not being delivered. Uh, but you can always go to our website for the latest information. But today I'm happy to welcome Professor Thorsten Becker from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Thorsten will discuss recent work at Stellenbosch University and the University of Cape Town using digital image correlation to characterize the creep damage of service exposed power plant steel through creep deformation measurements across non-uniform temperature and stress fields. And Thorsten, your topics are very timely. Uh, we've been seeing a lot uh, more interest in digital image correlation and of course, exploring ways to make power plants last longer and safer. Uh, it's a popular and very important global application. So I'm excited to learn more about your work. Thank you for taking the time to prepare this presentation and, and sharing it with the, the Gleeble community. Uh, I'll now hand this over to you and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much for the introduction and um, thank you for having me as part of the Gleeble webinars. Um, I'm grateful for having been given the opportunity to present here today. So as you already mentioned, my name is Thorsten Becker and the work presented here today is mostly been made possible by Melody van Rooyen um, as part of a PhD study and Professor Robert Knudsen at the University of Cape Town who house um, the Gleevel system that was used in this work. Um, as the title suggests, my work, my talk today focuses on the measurement of creep damage in X-service 12% chrome steel using the Gleevel uh, 3800 and digital image correlation. And this work forms part of a, a collaborative effort between Stellenbosch University and the University of Cape Town and also the High Resolution Transmission elect Electron Microscopy Unit at Nelson Mandela University under the auspice of Dr. Johann Westraut. And this work forms part of a bigger research drive to better predict the material degradation of components and systems that make up power plants, specifically power plants in South Africa. So I always like to start a talk with the slide to give a brief overview of where we are since we are not located in the typical Western world. Um, I'm sure you all heard of Cape Town. It's located at the southern tip of Africa. More relevant to this talk, the University of Cape Town is located behind Table Mountain, the, the image on the, on the left, and uh, the, on the bottom right, um, and it's located behind the mountain on the left side. Um, Stellenbosch University is located near Cape Town in a small town called Stellenbosch that is nestled between award-winning winning, uh, vineyards, which isn't always a good thing, but um, the University of Cape Town and Stellenbosch Universities are about 50 kilometers apart, which makes collaborations like these very simple. Okay, so just also some more background to um, the project um, to motivate this work. So let us delve into the background motivation. Um, so currently in SA, we are very familiar with the negative impacts of what we call load shedding um, on industrial as well as on a um, private scale. So in this graph, you see uh, the current life exhaustion, exhaustions relative to original di uh, design life of our current operating coal-fired power, power, coal power stations. 
So what we notice is that more than 75% of these stations have already exceeded the original intended lifetimes. So this places a lot of strain on critical components such as thick wall steam piping, which has been the focus uh, of the study. So while exceeding uh, design lifetimes doesn't necessarily imply that failure will occur, in fact, it's quite common to run power plants past the design lifetime, um, it does imply that proper maintenance and understanding of the life exhaustion of the components and structures that make up the power plant is vital. So if not properly managed, material failure can occur. This has happened in South Africa, resulting in unplanned outages and eventually leading to what we call load shedding. Okay, um, so generally speaking, mechanical representations of creep are often in the form of what we call creep curves. Um, what you see here is a, is a simplified plot of, um, uh, on the x-axis we've got time shown in the normalized form versus a creep strain or relative strain. So the x-axis being in the normalized form uh, where we have time t uh, over the total time to rupture and similarly on the y-axis we've got strain versus the strain to rupture. So typically during maintenance, plant operators uh, assess creep damage state, uh, the creep damage state of piping steel using quasi non-destructive technique called as surface replication, during which they paste acetate tape on the surface of a pipe to pull off a negative copy of the microstructure. So the inset images that you see on this slide is an example of such um, uh, surface replicas. Uh, these replicas are analyzed under a light microscope for creep cavity density, so essentially a creep cavity count, where a higher creep cavity density indicates a higher damage state or material life exhaustion shown here on the right um, in different categories. So this assists in terms of decision making uh, and component monitoring, repair or replacement to manage the continued reliability of a plant. Um, this surface replication, however, is very sensitive to microstructural heterogeneities and some alloys such as um, X20, which is the uh, commonly used material in our power plants, do not necessarily develop voids for appreciable service times uh, at certain temperatures. Um, then just a little bit on the, on the microstructure because it uh, gets important later on. Um, so besides cavity-based deterioration assessments, there's also other micro, microstructural aspects that we need to consider. So again, referring to X20, uh, it's, a, it's a complex in terms of its microstructure. Its main elements that contribute to creep resistance have been identified as dislocation densities, precipitates, and subgrains. And this makes replica-type investigations not always reliable, uh, as we will soon see. Moreover, um, as one can see uh, in this slide, there are a range of scales to consider when characterizing these features. Um, for instance, dislocation densities are challenging to accurately quantify using commonly available microscope techniques due to their heterogeneous nature, high resolution requirements, and difficult specimen preparation. We can also consider looking at subgrains, larger precipitates known as carbides, and intermetallic phases that form during creep, known as lava phase, which is rich in molybdenum. So during creep, these elements evolve and can indicate a level of material deterioration as well. So concerted efforts has been directed towards linking microstructural evidence and creep damage. However, these also present with limitations and challenges, and they are costly and time-consuming, somewhat biased and most importantly, very localized. Um, so this leads us to believe that a more uh, a complementary technique uh, techniques are necessary to assess remnant life of ex service material. And this is where this work really falls in, is in, in terms of complementary techniques. So arguably, arguably the most effective way to assess damage of ex service materials to perform post-exposure creep deformation tests. So these kind of standardized tests where the, a specimen is loaded in tension at a constant engineering stress while being heated up to a constant temperature, often in a, a type of tube furnace. The creep deformation is measured, for example, using uh, LVDTs, um, as shown in this uh, in the slide here, a simplified version. Um, the issue with these standardized tests is that we require large samples and 
um, a lot of samples since we require um, several tests to establish varying parameters in terms of creep data at varying stress, stresses and temperature. Um, so yeah, for each temperature and stress conditions, we would require a separate specimen which means large volumes of testing material needs to be extracted for service component. Um, this is not always feasible on account of limited amount of material and also the fact that we would have to remove large uh, sections of the material to assess its actual damage. So one means of conserving testing materials to reducing the specimen gauge length and using full field techniques such as digital image correlation, which has seen a vast application over the past decade in the field of material characterization. In contrast to conventional deformation measurement solutions with a larger footprint such as extensometers, a DIC allows for full field measurement of displacements of spatially tracking unique spectral features within subset windows, discretizing from sequential digital images. So the hypothesis behind this work um, lies in the ability to use the full field nature of DIC to form deformation tests at a temperature of a non-uniform temperature field to extract multiple creep curves. So the talk essentially is a summary of, of three papers that we've recently published. And um, if you want to know more about these papers, please contact me and I'm happy to share data or further information of these. Um, essentially, uh, what I'll be talking about is I'll just give an overview of our Gleeble DIC um, setup. Then I will venture, in using, venture into using our global DRC setup to measure what we call accelerated type creep tests or deformations. And then lastly, how we use the output data, i.e. the full field strain data, the temperature data and the load data to um, assess damage of a X-service exposed material. Um, I will also try and um, share briefly our future work and, and where we're going with this. Okay, so this is uh, the whole setup summarized in one slide. So here's a quick overview of the whole, what we call Gleeble DIC system. Um, so the Gleeble, as I previously said, is set up at the University of Cape Town. And um, it's a Gleeble 3800. And we use it to apply, apply our temperature and our load um, to and loading our, of our specimen. Um, the Gleeble allows our specimen to be loaded in a vacuum or within a vacuum chamber and um, heating through electrical resistance. The heat conduction along the specimen length towards the water-cooled grips causes a parabolic shaped uh, thermal profile to develop, which is controlled by a thermal couple, which we um, roll it to the center of the sample. And you can, on the on this left side of the slide, you can see the, the grips in the slide and the different components that I've, I've just mentioned. Um, we've also placed a two-level calibration plate inside the Gleeble chamber, as you can see at the bottom there. Um, this negated complex stereo calibration as we can, um, once the sample is mounted in the chamber and the door is closed, calibrate our DRC system. Um, and we don't need to um, take multiple images of our calibration plate due to its two-level nature. And this is important since the viewing window can cause distortions during the, due, due to the parallax effect. Um, and also a small note, we, um, we remanufactured this calibration plate out of PMMA um, to avoid problems in placing a conductive uh, material between the Gleeble grips. Um, the second component is of course the, the digital image correlation system, which we rigidly positioned in front of the Gleeble. Um, and this consisted of um, two cameras, a white LED arrays and a blue lens filter uh, to limit um, black body radiation. And I'll talk more, a little bit more about that a bit later. We also employed uh, macro lenses to allow a field of view about, to, about 50 to 60 millimeters, uh, which also include the, the view of the calibration plate so that we can spatially calibrate our image using a pinhole camera model. And the third component is an infrared imager, which you can see on the right. Um, to capture the full field thermal profile. And this was placed behind the Gleeble vacuum chamber. Um, so for this, we um, acquired a, a special infrared window. Um, also, we um, 
achieved, uh, we used a highly, um, uh, we tried to get a high emissive surface uh, of the specimen by coating the black, uh, the back of the specimen in black paint, heat resistant paint. And just as a note for the calibration of our IR imager, um, we, we initially placed four thermocouples along the specimen center line. So in the emissivity constants were adjusted to fit our measured thermocouple readings. This was a workaround solution in terms of calibrating our uh, IR camera with our uh, thermocouple readings uh, for the sample. So the assumption that we made here is that the temperature recordings made on the back of the surface are equivalent to those located at the front of the specimen. That is, the thermal gradients in the Z directions are considered negligible on a quarter of the relatively thin specimen thickness, which I'll get to in the next slide, and insulation provided by the paint coatings. So here we see um, our um, specimen setup. Uh, so for this analysis, we machined um, specimens from ex-service piping sections that were supplied by a local power utility. And you will see that we chose a rather unconventional specimen geometry in the form of a dog bone or, or wasted as um, gauge section. We chose this uh, wasted gauge region to create a plain stress setup to better capture strain deformation using digital image correlation. So DRC can only measure deformations on the surface and which by definition, those measurements will be in, in plain stress. Um, and therefore, by having a thin section, we, we assume that our thickness or through thickness is going to be only in plain stress, which simplifies our analysis. And moreover, the thinner section uh, achieves a, a steeper thermal profile, which is in, in our case what we want to obtain measurements at, at varying temperature. And these specimens were subjected to a maximum temperature of 600 degrees Celsius, which was controlled by the Gliebel. And this was by placing a thermocouple, as I previously said, in the center of the specimen. To ensure the speckle surface uh, has sufficient contrast and features, we applied a matte white VHT flame proof paint as a base coat and speckled it with also VHT black paint uh, on the surface, as you can see in the uh, image at the bottom. Um, this paint is composed of 10% by weight of titanium dioxide and amorphous uh, precipitated silica, uh, dissolved in organic solvents, and it has previously been successfully applied in displacement measurements of up to 1,100 1, degrees Celsius. Um, in addition to this, we also, um, after testing, uh, cut um, uh, samples for microstructural analysis. So these consisted of three millimeter diameter disks that were wire cut at two locations in the gauge region and one in the grip region, as shown in the graph. Okay, so in terms of our um, learning and heating cycle, in terms of programming the, the Gliebel, um, so because we are interested in creep damage, we employ a constant load type test, as shown in the graph here on the, on the far right. Um, the solid line shows the loading procedure and the dashed line shows the thermal loading procedure during testing. So sequentially, we first apply a small preload. This is followed by gradual heating to the maximum control temperature. Then we allow for some stabilization of the temperature field, which is the so short duration between T2 and T3. And then subsequently, we, we load our sample to the designated load and then remain at that load uh, either until failure or until the test is completed. Um, just in terms of some of the details of our setup, um, one of the big things of using DRC or big issues using DRC, uh, conducting DRC temperature is a darkening effect and black body radiation. So what you see on this side slide is uh, the speckle pattern at the top at various temperatures, starting with room temperature of approximately 21 degrees and all the way up to 1,100 degrees Celsius. Um, so on the graph at the bottom, on the left, you will see the effects of this, um, what, uh, in terms of our uh, histogram on our grayscale, in terms of this darkening effect. So what you'll uh, observe is that 
we get this this darkening effect, which is essentially a shift of our histogram into uh, the darker scale. So as the the red arrow pointing towards the left is indicating, and then at high to higher temperatures we get this black body radiation, which is an increase in contrast or a measure uh, light intensity, and in the in the higher in the white um, region, um, which can cause significant problems. So while modern DIC algorithms are robust to changes in contrast due to the zero normalized cross correlation matching algorithms, with the pixel intensity where the pixel intensity is normalized with the subset's mean uh, intensity, significant black body radiation, that is the, at very high temperatures, can cause DIC completely to fail. As you can see, there's no contrasting speckle patterns visible anymore. The graph on the left shows a histogram, oh, so I've already said that, excuse me. So we can calculate the noise versus signal ratio for the setup. Um, so the graph on the right shows an increase of black body radiation. Um, and versus uh, uh, image noise versus image signal uh, ratio. So as this ratio gets higher and higher, our DRC um, accuracy decreases significantly. And obviously at a ratio of one, we, we only see noise and no signal anymore, but we don't want to go that high in any case. But we, we can calculate a theoretical limit of about 800 to 900 degrees. Um, the band that you see here is shown for two different working distances, which is typically what we employed in our setup. So the cameras were placed between 40 to 55 centimeters away from the sample. So the way we, we um, limited this black body radiation, it's not, it's not possible to overcome it completely, but we employed um, uh, blue light filters. So on the graph on the left, um, you see the various um, transmittance uh, of the different components of our setup. So we have the white LED lights um, showing the wavelength, um, that's the wavelength they uh, give off. We have the filter, which is um, what essentially is filtered, the signal that's filtered. And we also have our um, Sony or our DIC chip, which is its sensitivity to light. And what you'll see is the solid line without markers is the resultant um, measurement that we obtain after we've applied the filters. Now you'll notice that um, there's a significant reduction in signal, but this is easily overcome by just um, flooding our specimen with more light to increase, uh, to obtain enough contrast between the uh, speckle pattern that we've applied. So based on this setup, we were able to obtain high contrast images of up to 900 degrees. So testing at 600 degrees, which is typically what we've done could be done without, uh, with no concern for saturation. Um, um, small note, you could, one could also use very narrow band pass filters. This was not a very narrow band pass filter, it's just a blue light filter. But the problem with using a narrow band pass filter is in terms of DIC applications, is that we don't have any contrast, meaning that we don't have any difference between light and darker regions as the, the band of visible light is very narrow. The um, figure on the right shows the measured temperature distribution. Um, the white mark in the middle um, shows the maximum temperature of 600 degrees C, which is the control temperature of the thermocouple. Um, the temperature distribution is parabolic in X, so along the loading direction, and quartic in Y, so transfer, or perpendicular to the loading direction. Um, also to note is that over the, in the, Y direction over the middle half, our temperature is fairly constant and it only really drops off towards the specimen edges. Okay, in terms of our displacement field, um, so here we see uh, a lot of graphs, but just to, to spatially orientate yourself. So on the vertical axis of all these graphs, you have the displacement measurement, which is also shown in the color bar at the top. Um, the different columns represent the different measurements. So UX, this, that's the direction of the loading. UY is a perpendicular loading direction. And UZ would uh, equate to the out of plane um, loading. And then the different rows uh, represents the different stages of our testing uh, as illustrated in the previous slide. So you'll notice that, for example, in the first column for the X displacements, as we're going through our loading cycle, you'll see the displacements increase um, 
uh, at each step, which is to expect it. Um, the same occurs in the wire displacement in the second column. Um, however, in the second e image from the top, you can see the uniform expansion, and that is during heating before the specimen contracts due to the Poisson's effect as the load increases. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. And then one of the benefits of the stereo setup is that we can measure out of plane deformations or in the Z direction, which is shown on the far right. Um, so shown here is um, at the bottom of the right hand column, you can see a, a, a snapshot of, a, of necking just before a sample fails. And you can nicely see the central region has, has um, what well, results in significant necking at the specimen center. Okay, then lastly, in terms of the stress field, this requires also some um, um, certain considerations. So the stress field can be obtained through the obviously the, the global load data and also the instantaneous cross-sectional area that we can obtain through the DIC data. So on the left side, you'll see the specimen and how it thins. Again, this image is shown towards the end of a test, just before failure, it's just to exaggerate the kind of effect that we observe. And we can very precisely measure the change in area based on the applied stress and the, the, the true stress due to the, the narrowing of the sample. And furthermore, on the right, we observe differences between the applied stress and the effective stress due to the thermal expansion. I alluded to this in the previous slide, and that's because of the non-uniform temperature distribution, which results in non-uniform thermal expansion, which results in a, a complex stress field. And this is obviously problematic if we want to con consider our test as a uni axial stress state. So the graph on the right shows the position x along the sample and the applied stress versus what we call true stress or effective stress. Um, this is shown for two different sample geometries. There's also, there's also a square sample geometry. I'd just like to focus on the flat geometry here. And also we we want to look at the triaxiality ratio, which is shown by the open markers. And the triaxiality ratio presents the ratio of hydrostatic stress to von Mises stress. A triaxiality ratio of 0.33 represents a uni axial stress state. We want to limit our analysis to a uni axial stress state to simplify our loading, as well as you can later see to treat the specimen as a one dimensional object. Um, we observe that the rectangular cross-section results in higher triaxiality tri ratios, and they are not representative, necessarily representative of a uni axial stress state. Uh, moreover, if we look at the flat region, we limit our analysis to the first five millimeters, so zero being in the sample center, and five millimeters to either side would make a, a region of interest of, of 10 millimeters uh, in our gauge region um, that we will uh, consider in our analysis. Okay, so just briefly the overview now. So we, we, we now have this data rich uh, measurement. So we have on the one hand, if we treat our, if we, if we simplify our specimen as a one dimensional um, sample, um, we do this to, as, as I previously said, to uh, negate the complexities of considering a, the sample as a three dimensional object and necessitating the analysis of a um, three-dimensional um, or three-dimensional stress state. So what we have is the, the strain tensor from our DRC displacement field, and this we obtain by differentiating our uh, displacement field. Um, we have our temperature from our, our IR camera, infrared camera, uh, and we also have our stress tensor, which we assume to be have only a stress in one direction based on our uh, final element analysis. Uh, and we have this along the length of the specimen mid midline, and we have this across the timestamps as the test is going on. Okay, so here's just a quick illustration of, of what this looks like. So the stress, the temperature, and the strain. And in this manner, we're able to measure multiple creep curves at several temperatures across over a single sample's gauge length. Um, We'll notice here of the short testing time. So this is in a duration of less than an hour. Um, and this also links with the high stress applied as indicated in the FEM model on the previous slide. So there's an important um, um, note that I need to make here is that this 
test is not the aim is not to replicate creep testing um, as such as shown here because of the short duration times. This is not representative of a creep test. The creep mechanisms are fundamentally different due to the short duration times. So we rather want to observe the differences in creep deformation rates and linking these to uh, the material's damage state, i.e. material's resistance to, uh, to, to creep loading uh, under accelerated uh, conditions. So an example data of, um, of this is shown in this next slide, slide 17. So here we compare different curves at different temperatures from a single sample. So this is for a what I term, what term a low damage sample, and I'll get to the, the, the differentiation just now. And what we obtain is multiple creep curves um, from this test. This test lasted for three hours, and you can see um, the temperature uh, uh, locations uh, that we chosen to plot this graph uh, range from 550 to 600 degrees Celsius. And on the right side, you see the creep rates uh, for respective creep rates from those curves. And the error bars indicate the variation in measurements between the two locations, i.e. between the left side and the right side of the specimen center line. Uh, and this demonstrates good repeatability within a single sample. And uh, as expected, the highest temperature achieves the highest um, strain rates and the lowest temperature, lower temperatures uh, experience the lower strain rate. As a side note, in terms of our damage uh, qualification. So we termed low damage material, a material that had measured between 60 to 90 uh, creep cavities per millimeter squared, and which was exposed to 545 degrees Celsius at pressures of 17 megapascals for uh, 130 hours. Medium damage uh, had 200 cavities per millimeter squared. I was exposed to the same temperature, but at a pressure of 19.4 megapascals for also 130,000 hours. And high damage material we termed as material that had 220 to 690 cavities per millimeter squared. This was subjected to a temperature of 543 degrees Celsius um, at a pressure of 18.1 megapascals and 156,000 uh, hours of operation. Okay, so now how do we how do we want to use this for um, improved damage identification? So in this slide, you see a comparison between the creep behavior of various degrees of surface exposed material at different temperatures. So the data represents four different tests done uh, on four different specimens. So on the right side, in the top C, you see the labels for virgin or new material X. EXL meaning low, EXM meaning medium, EXH meaning high damage, and the cross meaning that that test ruptured. Um, so we already observe a difference in the creep strain behavior. Uh, generally higher strain rates are observed for the surface exposed material, resulting in a more pronounced uh, creep curve. This implies that the secondary creep stage is reached sooner with some testing conditions uh, with the same testing conditions as, for example, the new material. At 600 degrees Celsius, the high damage material displays tertiary dominated creep curve and ruptures within one hour of testing. At uh, temperatures below 575 degrees Celsius, creep strains remain within the primary stage for all tested states, uh, as evident from the lack of the turning point in the uh, creep rate plots at the bottom, uh, the second bottom of the the slide. And what I would like to highlight, and we'll get to that later again, is that based on these observations, the low and medium damage material exhibit very similar minimum creep rates across different temperatures, although they have vastly different um, uh, uh, void cavity counts. Okay, um, so alternatively, um, we can also uh, plot these kind of curves instead of at different temperatures as in the previous slide, we can plot this at different stresses. So here we have new material and service, experiment, uh, ex service exposed material. And um, what is important, the difference between the, the, the previous uh, slide and this slide is that the previous slide, each curve represents um, one sample. 
Um, so essentially, that all that data only signified four tests, whereas here, um, this includes eight different tests because our stress state is constant, that's not varying, uh, and therefore uh, we require a different test to, for a different stress level. Um, so similarly to the previous slide, we observed that creep rates increase with stress between the low and high damage material. Um, and also the, the virgin material. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly talk about some microstructural um, comparisons. Um, I don't wanna go into too many specifics here, but um, I would like to ask the interested listener to refer to um, the papers that I've mentioned, otherwise you're welcome to contact me as well. Um, just briefly, we quantified the width of subgrains and diameters of metallic carbide precipitates. Uh, these elements are capable of slowing creep deformation by acting as obstacles to dislocation motion. The larger the size of these features, the lower the capability to hamper dislocation movement, the higher the damage of the material. In the top row, we see concentric backscatter scanning electron microscope images that we use to characterize these features parameters between X service and new material. The left figure at the bottom row indicates the range of subgrain sizes, various locations of the specimen and various damage states. And the right figure gives the particle diameters of carbides and lava phase particles for various locations for high and uh, new material. So to summarize, the larger subgrains are noticed for high damage material yet the low and medium damage specimens have similar subgrain sizes. Uh, this could be why, for example, smaller differences in creep behavior was observed between the low and medium damage states. And the reason for the complete weakening of the high damage material compared to the new material could also be associated with the enlargement of carbides and the increased presence of lava phases. So lava phases act as stress raises and can cause solute depletion surrounding I and alloy matrix. I would like to draw your attention to the uh, search trends in the bottom figures. So we first noticed that there's considerable scatter in this data in terms of the microstructure measurements, and that the only element that truly stands out from a statistically significant point of view is the number density shown in the white bars. So it's very difficult to, to really draw uh, conclusive uh, indicators for microstructure, although it's a very, very useful tool to highlight the kind of damage mechanisms that you observe. And um, also, um, we've done quantitative differences in dislocation quantities structure as shown in this ADF stem micrographs here between low and um, high damage regions. The heterogeneity in micrograin interior dislocation densities is noted in the lower material and with some micrograins displaying a higher concentration of dislocations than others. Um, lower densities are noted in the larger micrograins and the high damage material. Uh, comparisons between the respective grip and gauge regions of the low and high material states reveal substructure and damage features representative of different mechanisms, i.e. prior to testing, um, microstructure features reflect the pre-existing effects of diffusional creep regime, typically encountered in service conditions in power plants, whereas following the accelerated creep testing, um, tangles, pilots, and jogs of dislocations are evident in both material states, yet are more common in the lower material, as indicated in C, due to higher dislocation densities within the micrograins. So this suggests that the testing, that the, testing the accelerated creep testing is within the dislocation climb deformation regime, um, as suggested by the changes in the gauge microstructure which is what we expect. Okay, so now putting some numbers to all of this. So um, these tests are thus, um, we deem them as being in the dislocation creep dominated uh, regime. Um, so one typical description of dislocation creep, creep rate behavior is given by the Bird mukaji dawn expression uh, modified for threshold stress uh, as given in this slide. So you'll see the equation there. And just very briefly, um, important to this is the um, epsilon m, meaning the steady state creep rate or the minimum creep rate in terms of this material. 
A is a mechanism dependent constant, R is the universal gas constant, sigma X is the applied stress, Q is the activation energy, N is the stress exponent, sigma zero is the threshold stress, and then D, O, E, V, and K are various uh, constants um, related to this expression. So we can, for example, by plotting um, the inverse of temperature versus steady state creep rate multiplied by the temperature of a Young's modulus, we can obtain uh, and measure differences in activation energy in different, uh, which is shown here on the right. So each curve represents a single, um, is represents one specimen. So we can populate um, this, or we can calculate the activation energy from one specimen because of the varying temperature profile that we have. Um, alternatively, we can also look at um, the this, uh, stress exponent n by plotting various stresses, uh, stress states. Um, so the graph on the left, we see the stress component plotted against the steady, steep, steady state creep rate. Excuse me. Um, and the important note is that here each data point represents a different stress uh, because, again, just to reiterate that we are running at a constant stress and not varying stress. However, we can uh, obtain multiple curves from a single um, test rather, rather than a single curve from, from one test. Um, the premise of this work is not to establish pre-parameters, as I said before, as the validity of the accelerated tuck creep test is questionable. Rather, we want to use this data to establish clear indicators in damage that are complementary to, for example, void count or microstructural investigations. So this, for this work, we suggest the Zener-Holloman parameter, uh, denoted as Z. So you see the equation at the top essentially is a rearrangement of the previous equation that I've shown, or the equation shown on the previous slide. So the Zener-Holloman parameter has been used extensively in forming of steels at high temperature uh, when creep is active. The equation shown on the right, uh, um, Shown on the right represents the, the zener holloman parameter, which is denoted as Z. And by plotting the data this way, we can get a very clear distinction between the, damage, the different damage levels, between low, uh, high, and, and medium. Um, and this this, this um, data agrees with the microstructural and void count data in that extensive reduction in solid solution strengthening and pinning of precipitates through lava's phase and carbide coarsening is suggested as the main form of microstructural degradation in the high damage material over the other material states. And also the lower zener holloman values um, and dense carbide contributions for the medium material suggest the remnant creep life that is close to that of the low damage material. So though they have different cavity counts, um, their damage level could be um, similar. Okay, so in conclusion, um, so what I've presented here is a, um, we demonstrated a combined global DIC for testing procedure for full field deformation fields across a varying temperature uh, field. We limited surface radiation with the use of blue light filters and were able to test up to 900 degrees Celsius, although we, only we tested only at 600 degrees. Um, we used a VHT paint to facilitate testing up to, up to eight hours in this work. And um, in different work, this was not presented here, we used the same paint and we did tests for up to four months and the speckle pattern also maintained over those durations. Um, we were able to obtain um, a density of creep curve data for several temperatures from a single sample. Uh, in terms of the creep damage, um, we we highlight that we uh, obtain increasing, increasingly higher creep strain rates uh, between the virgin, lower, medium, and high damage material. And the higher Zeno Holloman uh, values were found for the high damage materials compared for the low and medium, so, uh, suggesting that it's a reliable damage indicator based on DIC measurements. Extensive reduction in solid solution strengthening and pinning precipitates through lava's phase and um, precipitate coarsening suggests as the main form of microstructural degradation in high damage state, and the slower creep rates, relatively lower Zener-Holloman values, and dense carbide distributions for medium materials suggest 
the remnant peat life is close to that of low despite the higher cavity, oh, cavity density count. Um, just some future work that we are currently busy with. Um, so this, the premise of this work was to have a varying temperature field. Um, we have also undertaken work with the Open University in the UK. This is not in a Gleeble, but this is uh, in a typical standard type PREEP setup. But we employ a also wasted, temp uh, wasted sample where our cross section varies uh, across the specimen length. And this gives us a varying stress profile at constant temperature. So conversely to a constant stress varying temperature, we have a constant temp temperature varying stress profile. Um, the setup, um, also we've, we've run it at 600 degrees Celsius, so similar to our Gleeble setup. Um, we've included a camera and DIC, and essentially the setup is very similar to what I've presented in this work. And an example of this is shown, of the samples shown on the right side of the speckle pattern. Um, we also, um, the reason why we're looking at various stress fields is obviously if you're looking at creep rates, there's advantages of considering varying temperature versus varying stress, uh, and, and that forms part of the work in, in that way. Um, and lastly, we also ideally, so what, what I presented here wasn't a, a, a quantitative um, difference in damage states, rather more qualitative in that we observe through the zena holloman parameter, we observe differences in damage level. So what we, current, what we are working on now is to use, for example, continuing damage models and link these directly with our strain measurements. And this is possible because we have this very data-rich measurements where we obtain multiple creep curves, for example, at a uh, given stress state with varying temperatures. So what you see here is, for example, an adapted Origanti model. And to highlight here with all these parameters, but the ones I want to highlight in the red circles are the parameters DS, DP, and DC. And those are essentially damage variables, meaning when they're zero, there's no damage. And when they're one, they're considered fully damaged. Uh, DP representing uh, particle coarsening, DS uh, representing subbrain evolution, and DC uh, representing void formation. Um, and so what I've shown in the Slide and the image on the slide on the right side is where we, for example, fitted this data um, to to our creep data, and in that way extracted through these partial differential equations of our damage state what the damage had to have been in the beginning of the test. Uh, but this work is still ongoing. Okay, and then lastly, I just want to thank all the contributions, um, and also want to thank to. Um, have the opportunity to present here today at the Gleebel webinar. Thank you. Thorsten, thank you. Uh, great presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, we do have uh, some time for questions, and we've got a, a few uh, that, that have, have come in. Uh, so on the call, we typically have a lot of, of rolling rolling experts. So I've got a question here about rolling, uh, in the, in the directional of the rolling. So uh, are there any concerns about the directionality of stresses or the rolling direction? I believe your samples were taken in the axial pipe direction, which is the steel rolling direction, but the internal yeah. pressure stresses will be primarily in the circ circumferential direction, which is transverse to the rolling direction. So any concerns there? Yeah, that's a very good that's a very good question. And and ideally we we would have to do the tests in um, the circumferential direction because that's where the higher stresses are. Um, we are in pursuit of minimum um, working on, on smaller samples or downsizing these samples in similar work so that we can fit in samples in the circumferential direction as well. Okay, great. So a question here, if you want to jump maybe back to slide 13 to 15, somewhere in there, I believe. Okay, just give me a second. Yep. And I'm not sure exactly which slide, but the question said, uh, that you had noted using uh, four points on the sample and plotting that data across the sample with a thermal gradient. Uh, is there, I, I guess, uh, how much time were you saved by doing those those four points versus the traditional methods? I guess, how else could you have done that work? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's that's a very good question. So, you know, is that is the IR camera really um, necessary? And, and the question is, 
not not really. So what we wanted to know is because of this varying temperature field, uh, what the effect is of the thermal expansion and, and does this induce uh, a, a different stress field, which it does, than um, if we just treat it as uniform across the width of the sample. Mm -hmm. um, and by just placing four um, thermocouples along the length of the sample, is we get the um, quadratic profile in the axial direction, but we don't have the understanding of the quartic profile in the in the uh, tra transverse direction. And, and that was important to us for subsequently, uh, if I go back to this, where was it? Uh, sorry, um, the slide of the here of the finite element model in terms of the the, the effect of the thermal expansion on the stress. But, but but essentially, it's not always necessary subsequently for future tests. Okay, and actually, that was the uh, next question uh, that I had was, I guess it's on slide eight, you show that IR camera. Uh, and I, I guess, were you, you know, satisfied with, because we're looking at that as well. That's something that, you know, obviously non-contact measurement is really important uh, for a number of reasons and, you know, increases flexibility. Uh, so I guess, you know, were you satisfied with the performance of that? system or other systems, I guess, if, you, if I look at a few, um, and then is, how is it integrated with your data? I assume it's off offline integration. Yeah, that's also a good question. So I think in the IR system, we, we could have done better, if I just go to this slide, um, you know, the the field of view, as you can see in the, in the camera, on this IR camera, isn't ideal at all. Um, so we would have had to have better lenses and positioning of the IR camera closer to the sample. So what, what was very challenging here was um, to get the field of view both in the DRC and the IR system um, ideally lined up. Um, you know, this, this image doesn't show the best setup, it just shows a setup. We've, we've got a better field of view than this, but, it, but it, there are these challenges in setting it up. Um, the other difficulty, as I alluded to in the slides, was just the calibration of the system. So, you know, as soon as you take uh, want to take accurate temperatures with the IR camera, you, you need to make sure that you know what your emissivity is and, and the, the losses of that through all the components that you're measuring. So that's just another thing to consider when using IR equipment. Okay, great. And then you had mentioned, uh, I guess on one of the last slides, the speckle pattern that you had used uh, lasted eight hours, uh, which is, is pretty good. Had Do you think it could have gone longer? I guess what's the or were you seeing some de degradation after that? Uh, we, we, we've done the same kind of speckle pattern in, the, in these um, varying stress tests that are showed on the second last slide. And, and those lasted up to four months. So if I just go to quickly go to this image. So these tests lasted up to four months uh, and the, the, the paint was completely fine. Like we still got very good measurements. The, the biggest issue actually is as soon as we get to very high strains um, and there's significant stretching uh, and the, I guess, the compliance of the paint, you know, it starts flaking off and mm -hmm. you lose then the, the speckle pattern and the signal for DIC to take reliable uh, measurements. Okay. And then I know, you know something you had made the comment, you know, you're kind of not doing a creep test. I don't think you're simulating the actual creep. You're, you're testing, in some cases, the material after it's been in service. Uh, but I, have you looked at the data that you, you know, as part of this paper, this project, and correlated that back to, you know, the, the traditional creep tests that, you know, do take months or longer? Um, was there a correlation between them? Yeah, we, we have done that. So initially, we, the initial correlation, um, so we've correlated to, for example, creep tests that lasted for about six months. Not, we're not talking in the decades here. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this is a traditional creep test for six months, uh, maybe it was slightly longer, I'm not 100% sure now, but essentially in the primary and the secondary um, regime, the, the data agrees very well, but then as soon as we go to the tertiary, um, we, we observe a significant differences, and we believe it's due to this localized necking where we've got this very high temperature in the center, and you know, you can see on the last slide, just this is at the point of failure, you can see the sparks flying, and, and then you get this very uh, significant thinning, and, and you know, we're really stretching our measurement capabilities at this point. Um, you know, we've got very high strains, we've got uh, very high strain gradients, so our, our stress model just probably doesn't apply that well anymore, uh, and so the short answer is, at that point, it doesn't agree that well anymore. Right, but it does make for pretty pictures at least, which is good. <laughs> exactly. So that's good. Uh, 
I think maybe one more one more question here. You know, some of these tests were very long, uh, using DIC, you know, eight hour tests. Uh, maybe a silly question, but any issues with you know the amount of data that you're you're pulling off of that? Is, is, you know, there's a lot of data, a lot of storage. So there's some operational issues you need to deal with there, and just in terms of computing power and storage. Yeah, I mean, w one of the things that I wish we had, which we don't, is um, link uh, sort of a linking of timestamp between the Gleevel and our DRC data. So we had to do some, um, you know, time stamping techniques where we so to to exactly correlate our uh, Gleevel applied temperature and load to our DRC images. So that's definitely something that that is important going forward. Um, in terms of the data, yeah, it's a lot of data. Um, luckily, with images, it's okay. The images, I mean, they're big, but they're not that ex that huge that you can't deal with them anymore. Okay. Um, and I, I'm always, I always think it's better to have more data and then filter out than rather than too little data. Agreed. I think almost everyone listening would would agree as well. More data, generally better. Just so I think we we are out of time here. I want to uh, Thorsten again. Thank you. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, to everybody that's out there, we will make this available as a video uh, shortly. Usually a couple of hours, we can get the video up online, uh, and also the presentation will be available as a PDF. Uh, and a reminder uh, that there is no webinar next week, but we will have one the following week on the on December seventeenth. Uh, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time, and you know we are out of time now. But if you have any questions. Uh, please do reach out to, to me or Thorsten. We, we, I can help make that connection if you need need to. Um, the video and link will again will be available on our website soon. If you have any question, technical questions, uh, again, uh, the best way to contact our support team is to use the support portal that's available on our website. Again, if you go to uh, Google.com and then click on resources, and then there's the customer support portal. Uh, it's the best way you can create a support ticket, and there's also a knowledge base that you can search. So there's a lot of valuable data there. Uh, if you have any questions about how Gleeble can support your research, please email me or any member of our team. Uh, we'll make sure that we get an application expert uh, to help you uh, find the right solution. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Please stay safe and healthy. And, and Thorsten, thank you for uh, a great presentation. Thank you.